In 1942, Adolf Hitler demanded something no engineer had ever attempted. He ordered a train so massive it would need tracks twice as wide as any in existence, with double-decker coaches taller than most houses and interiors that resembled luxury hotels more than rail transport. It wasn't just ego, this was power made physical. He planned to connect Berlin with his imagined empire using rolling palaces equipped with cinemas and ballrooms. But the design defied physics, terrifying even the Nazi engineers forced to build it. If this is what you saw in the title, the reality is even stranger and far darker. Why would someone build a hotel on rails and what horrific cost hid behind the blueprint? In the summer of 1942, inside the map-lined offices of the Reich Chancellery, a single number landed on the table like a bomb, 3,000 millimeters. Hitler had grown impatient. He stared at the railway diagrams, thin black lines snaking across Europe, and dismissed them as relics of a world he planned to erase. Standard gauge, 1,435 millimeters, was, in his eyes, an insult to the future. He wanted a track so wide it would make every other railway obsolete by sheer presence. The order was blunt and absolute. The new railways would be three meters wide, more than double the norm. Not a suggestion, not a proposal, a command. Albert Speer, tasked with turning fantasy into concrete, understood what this meant. The scale was unprecedented. A human could stand between the rails of a standard track and touch both sides. On the Breitspurbahn, a person would look up and see a canyon of steel, the rails stretching wider than the wingspan of a light aircraft. The blueprints began to sprawl. Every calculation, every cost estimate, every engineering memo revolved around that single, monstrous figure, 3,000 millimeters. Hitler's language was contemptuous. He called ordinary trains niggardly, unworthy of his empire. He wanted a railway that would make Paris, Moscow, and even London seem provincial. He wanted one that would intimidate the passengers. The railway would be the spine of Germania, the world capital rising in Berlin. It would connect the heart of the Reich to the grain fields of Ukraine, the oil wells of the Caucasus, and the imagined colonies far to the east. The message was clear. This was not about transport. This was about domination, about remaking the very map of Europe in steel and concrete. Engineers from the Reich Ministry of Transport were summoned. Some tried to argue. They pointed to the incompatibility with the rest of Europe, the absurdity of building an entire network that no neighboring train could ever use. Hitler brushed them aside. The rest of Europe was going to become a part of Germany anyway, he snapped. The plans grew even more ambitious, routes from Berlin to Vladivostok, to India, to Gibraltar. The scale of the ambition outstripped even the wildest dreams of railway engineers. What Hitler demanded was not a train, but a moving monument, an iron road so vast it would swallow the continent. The 3,000 mm gauge became the anchor for every decision that followed. It dictated the size of the engines, the height of the carriages, the thickness of the rails, it was the number that haunted every engineer forced to work on the project. The human scale vanished. All that remained was the shadow of a dictator's will, cast across a map of Europe by a ruler who believed that reality itself could be bent to his design. Design teams gathered around tables stacked with sketches, each one more extravagant than the last. The brief was simple, nothing short of imperial grandeur. The coaches stretched 42 meters long, 6 meters wide, and 7 meters high, double the height of a typical carriage. Inside, the plans called for a world that had never existed on rails. There were ballrooms with vaulted ceilings, chandeliers glinting over polished floors. Entire cars were set aside for cinemas, where passengers could watch the latest films in plush velvet seats as the countryside blurred past. Bathing salons, promised marble tubs and hot water on demand. Observation decks ran the length of the upper level, wrapped in glass, offering a panoramic view of the empire rolling by. Every detail was calculated to impress. 
The dining halls were designed to rival the great hotels of Europe, with tables set for 12 and silver service at every meal. There were barbershops, reading rooms, and even a promenade deck, a walking path inside the train so travelers could take their exercise without ever stepping onto foreign soil. Some blueprints included anti-aircraft gun emplacements on the roof, just in case the Reich's new palace on wheels needed defending. The amenities list read like a fever dream. A train with the comforts of an ocean liner built to glide from Berlin to the farthest reaches of Asia. The promise was that a German official could leave his office in the new capital, board a train, and arrive in Kiev or the Caucasus days later without ever touching the world outside. The windows were there to let in the light, not the landscape. The Reich's planners imagined a future where the elite would glide above the conquered territories, insulated by steel, glass, and luxury. Industrial designers, some fresh from work on cruise ships and grand hotels, were tasked with turning these fantasies into technical drawings. They produced cross-sections showing double-height lounges, spiral staircases, and retractable platforms. The sheer mass of each carriage, over 100 tons fully loaded, was an afterthought. The focus was on spectacle. Every meter of the train was meant to dwarf anything that had come before. The message was clear. This was not a means of travel. It was a rolling display of power, built to intimidate anyone who saw it rumble past. But beneath the gold leaf and velvet, the numbers began to pile up. The engineers, buried in blueprints, started to realize that the laws of physics were not so easily bullied. The weight, the height, the impossible dimensions, every new amenity added another problem. For now though, the Reich's fantasy was still growing, unchecked by reality. A train this size doesn't just challenge tradition, it defies physics. On paper, the Breitspurbahn would barrel across the continent at 150 miles per hour, which is 67 meters per second. Each carriage, loaded with marble baths and velvet lounges, would tip the scales at 100,000 kilograms. But the real problem lay in the curves. To keep this moving monument on the rails, engineers needed to calculate the force pressing outward as the train tried to turn, a force that grows with speed and mass and shrinks only as the curve gets wider. The numbers are relentless. The formula is simple. Acceleration equals speed squared divided by the radius of the curve. Plug in the figures, 67 meters per second squared divided by an 8,000 meter radius, and the answer is 0.56 meters per second squared. Multiply that by the mass of a single carriage, 100,000 kilograms, and the result is a lateral force of 56,000 newtons. That is the sideways shove every wheel would endure, just to keep the train from flying off the track at every bend. For comparison, a standard express train running at the same speed would produce less than half that force, thanks to its lighter weight and narrower gauge. The Breitspurbahn's wheels would have to survive a constant pounding, the steel flanges grinding against the rails with every kilometer. At these loads, the metal itself becomes a weak link. Friction would eat away at the wheels, heat would build up, and cracks would start to form, tiny at first, then catastrophic. The engineers tried to compensate by making the curves enormous. An 8,000 meter radius, five miles, just to keep the forces manageable. Even then, every axle would be pushed to its limit. The ground beneath would have to absorb not only the weight pressing down, but the sideways punch of each turn. No ordinary track bed could survive it. The pressure would shatter concrete, buckle steel, and sink the rails into the earth. The only answer was to redesign the entire foundation, a continuous wall of reinforced concrete running from Berlin to Moscow, just to hold up this fantasy. The math did not care about politics or monuments. It cared about mass, speed, and the unbreakable rules of motion. In meeting after meeting, the calculations piled up. Every time the designers tried to solve one problem, the numbers handed them two more. The very ambition that made the Breitspurbahn so grand also made it impossible. The laws of nature, unlike the laws of the Reich, would not bend. Senior engineers pressed for answers gathered in the Reichsbahn's central office as the numbers grew more absurd. 
The challenge was not just about building a bigger train, it was about finding some way, any way, to keep the project technically alive without actually having to make it real. The blueprints on their desks demanded a foundation that could bear the weight of a moving skyscraper. Traditional railway sleepers and gravel beds used for every train in history would be crushed to powder under the Breitspoorbahn's mass. So the engineers proposed a workaround that bordered on the surreal, a continuous slab of reinforced concrete stretching from Berlin to Moscow. Not rails on wooden ties, but rails bolted directly to a solid highway of stone and steel. This was not an upgrade. It was a total replacement for the Earth itself. The Reichsbahn memos from 1942 outline the plan in dry bureaucratic language. The reports describe a ballastless track system designed to spread the weight and prevent the train from sinking into the ground. The concrete slab would be two or three meters thick in places, reinforced with enough steel to build a fleet of battleships. Every kilometer would demand thousands of tons of material, poured and leveled in a continuous, unbroken line across the continent. No one in the room believed it would work. The soil of Eastern Europe was soft and unpredictable. Rivers, marshes, and villages lay in the way. The cost in concrete, steel, and labor was beyond calculation. But the alternative, telling the Fuhrer that his dream was impossible, was unthinkable. Instead, the engineers leaned into the fantasy. They sketched ever larger locomotives, each one more monstrous than the last. Some designs called for eight diesel engines, each the size of a submarine power plant, chained together in a single groaning machine. Others suggested gas turbines or propeller-driven engines borrowed from Zeppelin airships. The point was not to solve the problem, but to bury it under layers of technical complexity. As long as the project remained in the research phase, no one had to build anything. The Reichsbahn's internal reports grew thicker, filled with calculations for axle loads, stress diagrams, and material requirements that no factory could meet. Engineers began to compete not to find solutions, but to see who could draw the most outlandish locomotive, who could specify the most exotic alloy, who could require the most impossible part. Every new memo pushed the start date further into the future, buying precious time while the war raged on. These desperate workarounds were not just technical, they were Montréal as well. Everyone understood that a concrete slab of this scale could never be poured by machines alone, the only way to make it real was to conscript an army of forced laborers, prisoners of war, concentration camp inmates, entire populations pressed into service. The luxury of the train, the beauty of its blueprints, hid the horror of what would be required to lay its track. In the end, the engineers' inventions became a silent protest, a way to keep the dream alive on paper while making sure it died before it ever reached the ground. Organization Todd, the regime's construction arm, kept its instructions chillingly simple. The concrete slab beneath the Breitspurban would stretch for hundreds of miles, swallowing rivers, forests, and villages. Machines alone could never build it. The planners wrote memos outlining the need for labor on a scale that only the Reich's forced workforce could provide. Prisoners of war, camp inmates, and civilians rounded up from conquered lands. Every meter poured meant weeks of backbreaking labor under guard, with no end in sight. The numbers were left vague, but the intent was clear. The railway's foundation would be laid by those the Nazis considered expendable. This was not a side project. The railway was designed as the main artery for draining the east. Freight projections called for entire harvests, grain, oil, ore, shipped from Ukraine and Russia to feed the Reich. One internal report boasted that Ukraine's wheat could be moved to Germany in weeks, not months. Above, the luxury coaches promised comfort for settlers and officials. Below, the human cost was buried in concrete, erased from the blueprints. The beauty of the train was a mask for plunder and suffering, its tracks a scar across the continent. By 1943, the fantasy of the Breitspurban collided with the reality of war. The Red Army had broken the German advance at Stalingrad. Steel, once reserved for monumental trains and concrete highways, was now rationed for tanks, guns, and the desperate defense of the Reich. 
Albert Speer, facing impossible demands and a collapsing front, issued quiet instructions to halt work on the project. The railway files were boxed up, the blueprints rolled and archived deep in ministry vaults. Not a single rail was ever laid. The only traces left are in museum storerooms, models of double-decker carriages gathering dust in Nuremberg, technical drawings stamped with obsolete ministry seals, and procurement records showing steel allocations abruptly cut off in 1943. The vision of a train so wide it could swallow a street vanished into the bureaucracy of defeat. Today, high-speed trains streak across Europe on standard gauge rails, running faster and farther than the Reich ever imagined, proving that efficiency, not ego, is what endures. The Breitspurbahn survives only as a cautionary relic, a blueprint for a future that never arrived. Monuments to ego always demand a human cost. Today, the blueprints for impossible empires linger in archives, while real trains serve real people on rails barely half as wide. The lesson remains, ambition unbound by reality or conscience is a warning, not a blueprint. History's biggest failures start with leaders who mistake size for strength. What would we build if we measured progress by humanity, not scale? Share your thoughts below.